very briefly, I mean, Anna needs no introduction. She is, so she's one of the organizers and the, the driving force behind this, this conference. So Anna, as you, as you all know, she comes from the history, from art history. But then, you know, some years ago, she uh, uh, joined our department, which was very good news for us. And so this is a department on the history of science. But as you know, it's science, science very broadly conceived. So we have, you know, multiple interests, not, not only technical interests in science. So having an historian, a person with a, with a, a basic training on the history of science, on the history of art was very important for us. So Anna has been doing, you know, wonderful work and, you know, in a number of areas that cover, uh, that go from history of gardens to, you know, history of water management to environmental history, uh, history of cities and urbanism and this type of things. And all of these um, approaches connected with this broad idea of history of science as history of knowledge. You know? So, I mean, we are very happy here at the, at the department of having her. She is now, Anna, she is now the coordinator of our research unit, SUCT, which is an, an added responsibility, but the, the, this coordination does not seem to hinder her rhythm of publication, which is always very high. And so, Anna, it is truly a pleasure in now in hearing you. Anna will be speaking about making paradises, the expertise be behind the beauty. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Enrique. It is such an honor uh, and a great pleasure. And it was a great luck to, to come to this department and to be surrounded by uh, these colleagues. Uh, such as Enrique, Ana Simões, Pedro, Jorge Nuno, Ricardo, and all our colleagues of SUP. This is like, uh, uh, I, I love the expression from Joaquim Alves Gaspar, this is the magic of the, of the corridor. <laughs> so we have everything there side by side. Okay, so thank you very much for your very nice words. So let's start. Okay. So I'm going to talk about something totally different from everything that you have heard today. Um, so making paradise, the expertise behind beauty. Um, in fact, so I'm going to talk about gardens, um, the, the correspondence between paradise and, and gardens is quite ancient. In fact, paradise which was the first definition of uh, a garden uh, in ancient Persia. And it is uh, based on that, that then uh, a Latin, um, uh, um, used this, uh, uh, this word paradisus and this then inspired all um, other words of paradise in our vernacular European languages. Um, and the connection between paradise and the garden is since its beginning, um, not only in ancient Persia, but then uh, with the uh, Christian uh, uh, re religion. So we are going to start by that. Well, I could talk about so, so many different things. When I'm talking about the expertise that lies behind gardens, I could talk about, uh, well, even uh, astrology, because in fact, there are some manuscripts that uh, describe how uh, the moon and the sun inspire, inspire, no, but how they influence um, plants. I could be talking about horticulture, so applied science, how to make uh, plants grow in a certain way, in a desired way. I could talk about botany, uh, here about uh, the characteristics and taxonomy of plants. I could talk about geometry as a uh, perspective was so, so important, uh, not only geometry in general, but then perspective was so, so important, for example, for an autre. And then I could talk about um, well, all the arts, architecture, sculpture, painting, um, because they are the decorative and more than decorative. Sometimes they, 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 they are the ones that uh, can suggest the message of the patron. And then I could talk about all the mechanical uh, arts, so that uh, how to make automata, how to make sun um, clocks, and all this is from 15 or 16 or 17 centuries. Um, also about water jokes, and here we have something that will get us closer to our topic, which is like a, a, already an image of a garden, an ordered garden with the tree of life in the middle. 
but I'm, I could talk about all these. This is the expertise behind gardens. I have chosen one topic, which is um, trees. In fact, this is all about trees and knowledge about trees and how they connect with paradise. So here is one of the most uh, interesting image and one of the most beautiful uh, images about the Garden of Eden. And this Garden of Eden has something very special. It has a palm tree. It has, well, let's talk still up until here about an apple tree. And then it has a drago tree. And this is something that will take us directly to the Garden of Esperic. Uh, this apple tree is, it will be, uh, after a while, there will be some confusion with um, um, orange tree because it was, um, they say they always describe this as the golden, um, the golden fruits, golden fruits, and golden fruits could be uh, just oranges, or it would be more logic that they will be, they were oranges. So, and here it's important, this date, 1493, it's too soon, and we have here a drago tree. And so we have a date palm, an apple tree, golden apples, and then a drago tree. Okay, and then it's going to appear in one of the major work pieces, a work of arts by El Bosco, Jardim de las Delicias. So, and here we have in the Garden of Eden, uh, we have again a drago tree, which is not uh, uh, native in Europe. So the drago tree is original from the Canary Islands, Madeira, and Cabo Verde. <laughs> so by then, only the Portuguese, the Spanish, and the Italian had been there. So according to some, the Canary Islands were the Islas Afortunatas of the classical antiquity, and the golden garden of the Esperis would be in the valley of La Orotava in Tenerife. So the dragon tree would be the fearsome dragon uh, that guar guarded the golden apples that Hercules would seek. Therefore, the Canary Islands were envisioned as paradise itself. The palm tree and a dragon tree were in the garden of the Irish merchant uh, uh, Juan uh, Cologan de Franchi, Marquis of Sozal, in La Orotava, when Humboldt visited it. So therefore, a landscape still recognized, recognizable in the 19th century. So a place where you could find both palm trees with uh, um, dragon trees. Now, the drago tree is depicted for the first time in 1470 uh, here. Uh, so you, you can see this. And this is, in fact, it could only, where, where does this image come from? It could only come from uh, the Canary Islands or Madeira. There is no other way. Um, so we have this. Um, these are like the first uh, depictions of the drago tree. So in 1470 and then 93, and 15, and nothing of these, of these drawings or paintings uh, is related with the Iberian Peninsula, although we know that uh, the tree itself is related with uh, the Iberian peoples, at least, as Madeira was already with the Portuguese and the Canary Island with the Spanish. However, even almost one of the earliest dates, it was already in Lisbon. So the drago tree in Lisbon in 1494, described by Munzer. So he saw um, a drago dracaena, so the one that is really from uh, the Canary Islands, at the monastery of St. Agustin. And then we'll have a further description of Clusius that he, see, he says that for the first time in his life, he saw a drago tree and it was in Lisbon. But now I'm just going to make a, a parenthesis here, then I will continue to talk about trees. Uh, and it is to make a connection with the talk by Anne-Marie Jordan. I have to tell you something else about exotic and not only exotic, exotic trees. So, oh, this is the one by um, Clusius. Sorry, it's, it's going to be, oh, happen just in a minute. So he says, now it's in 1564. He says, that the first time I saw this tree was in Lisbon in 1564 at the monastery dedicated to the virgin called Grasa of the order of Augustines, probably the same. So the monks did not appreciate it, claiming it did not produce flowers or fruits. Nevertheless, afterwards I discovered reality was very different 
when the following year, a friend offered me a branch of this same tree. So they didn't know anything about the, uh, the, the, blood, the, gum, the gum that uh, the, this tree produced, produces. And here we have, you know, now we all know that the drago tree is very, very uh, important uh, here in Portugal and very important in our botanical gardens. And so, but it's, it was not originally in the, the botanical garden of Ajuda. We see that it is being transported uh, there uh, in the beginning of the 20th century. Now, so the taste for exotic, this is what I wanted to tell you because when Munzer describes the drago tree, he also describes that he saw not as he not crocodiles as they appear here uh, at, in this depiction of the Leiden garden, but he saw them like this hanged in churches. So this is what Moon <laughs> describes. So exotic is in fact the word in um, early modern Lisbon. It's the word. <laughs> uh, it's the key word, the key, the key idea, the key layout. <laughs> they love exotic things. Well, King Domanoli loved, loved exotic things. So this all this brings us to the Garden of Esperich. There, there are many depictions. Well, I love this one with the beautiful Esperich taking care of orange trees. In fact, that apple tree, probably it's a golden, um, those golden apples are probably oranges. And so let's talk about oranges. Well, now our second uh, tree that was in that first image of the Garden of Eden. And so about trees, we have a lot to tell. Um, maybe some of you will recognize this image, the beautiful citrus of the Palace of Fronteira. And so here in this um, palace, which has a much more complex story, but uh, Julian Pascal, he went there. Well, in the end, Anna, this is a garden of Esperic. And, it, it, and in fact, maybe it is. Well, I'm going to talk to you, talk you talk to you about another garden of spirits, the Quinta da Bacalhoa. Quinta da Bacalhoa was in fact like this. So what is now a vineyard of the famous wine of Bacalhoa was an orange grove. And we could see it from uh, above. So we would walk up from here, from the palace to the house of fresh, to the tank, and we would see the oranges just like this. So we would see like a tapestry of, um, of uh, orange trees with the, the, uh, the orange fruits, the golden fruits. I could only understand that this is how it looks now, so totally different of, from what it was. And I only understood how this should be envisioned when I went, it is a palace, when I went to Morocco, to Marrakech, and this is a palace from the same period of Bacalhoa. So they are more or less from the same days, dates. Um, and at the Palais Abadi, in fact, we walk like this and they have the trees planted um, below so that we um, can see only like the top of the trees. And this is amazing because if it is, then you understand what was the goal of having the trees here in a different height. Because the goal is that they, if they are full, it would be like a tapestry. And this is very uh, um, Islamic culture and Islamic art. Okay, and so this is it. This is how it all begins. So um, the citrus were introduced. Well, they say some, some, they, some experts say that the Romans already knew about them. Maybe it's true. But the one thing is to know about them Another thing is to really be able to acclimatize and reproduce them in large scale. And that will only happen, happen not even at this period, but later. Okay, so here, the orange trees were like very exotic and they were only at the big centers of power and religion. And so we have here Patio de los Naranjos in Cordoba, in Sevilla, and also it was also in Silk. And so orange be became so, so, um, so part of our landscape that to Duarte Nunes Leão in the 1600s, he talks about an orange landscape. So how is this going 
from the center of power to a landscape of oranges. Well, it only has to, it all has to do with this expertise, the, this expertise of grafting. So they became, uh, because in the 15th century, we only have in Portugal, uh, the descriptions of oranges in small courtyards, in small gardens. In fact, I'm going to say the word in Portuguese, it's in quintais. Quintal, os quintais havia uma laranjeira, uma figueira. Okay, and then after a century, it's all over the landscape. To such an extent that in the, in the 17th century, uh, Giovanni Battista Ferraro, he already talks about Aurantio Olisiponensis. So there was an orange from Lisbon. Okay, now it was so, so common in Portugal that there is a book from the 16th century that is being translated at the same time in Portuguese and French. So the book is originally in Latin. It's about uh, plants, a history of plants. And they are translating it uh, in uh, 1718 uh, in Lyon. And look how the same page is different when it is in Portuguese or in French, because he says, well, I don't have to describe oranges in here because they are so common, everybody knows them. So it doesn't need any description. So it became an orange of landscape due to expertise. And that expertise, while here, the expertise was general and it is it is not something of uh, made by physicians or or, botan or botanists uh, it is it was made by gardeners common people at this while here it is already very common and uh, um, and grafting was used by everyone in central and northern europe it's still oranges are still so exotic they are like um, precious stones and so you see here uh, the orangery of Versailles, so Versailles um, orangery, which the, to, to such an extent that as they had to make buildings uh, to keep oranges, they would um, then the words for greenhouses in English and in French is orangery or orangerie. But what are these? These are greenhouses to put oranges. Well, when spring comes up, then they are going to change the uh, orangeries the orange trees from outside to inside. And that's why they all grow like this. It's not like in Portugal, where you have them uh, in the soil. No, they have to be in boxes because they are always to, uh, they are always being moved from inside and outside because some parts of the year, it's, they have to move them um, for, the, for the night. So during the night, they have to put them inside and then they come out. They are such an exotic and so precious. It's so difficult to have oranges. And in fact, the oranges that are here in Versailles, they were imported from Portugal and Seville. And so that they are so exotic and so precious that they even make jewelry inspired by these orange trees. Uh, again, I have here some more images talking about, so you see it's citrus. They appear side by side with uh, silverware. So, now, as they, but they want these precious fruits, so they, as they want them so much and they feel that they are so exotic and so beautiful, well, the, the development of greenhouses is going to span all over Europe. And the expertise on this will um, uh, be uh, uh, translated in several, several uh, books that are going to be produced uh, explaining this, how to grow oranges in Central and Northern Europe and how to make greenhouses, how to make all these. And so it's, uh, you have thousands of books uh, here, thousands, no, but well, dozens of books. Um, while here, we only have one, um, and one in the 16th century, just before it was uh, all over the landscape. And here, uh, and this book, it's so, so amazing. It's uh, the and first- uh, Excuse yeah. me, 20 minutes have passed, okay? Okay. Just Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, just one, five more minutes. Okay, so uh, Gregorio de los Rios uh, is the one who uh, in 1592 uh, wrote about uh, gardens. It's, it is the first treatise on gardens. And he says that he's going to do something totally different. He works for Philip II at Aranjuez. And he says that he's going to do something totally different. It's here. 
So he's going to write just about beautiful uh, plants uh, and nothing that has to do with orchards because on those topics, others have written. Um, of course, he's inspired by a totally different kind of books. Uh, and so he's going to make one exception. Uh, although he says that he's, he doesn't have, he doesn't want to write anything about uh, orchards or fruit trees. Well, there is one exception, of course, orange trees as they are so beautiful. And so it is him that explains everything about the techniques uh, on how to cultivate uh, oranges. Now here, I'm not going to explain everything, but I have made the comparison about how, how what is the technique described by Gregory Lojrir, and then uh, another one from Northern uh, Euro Central Europe, um, and it continues. And so here we also have like uh, um, the different uh, calendar of all the years. So the different activities that are going to be performed in the Iberian and in Central and Northern Europe. Well, when it is, when all this explain, uh, it will come up uh, that uh, uh, the expertise that was built here, it was pioneering and it, it is uh, in fact uh, totally different because uh, not only different but because the, it was much more difficult for them. I could talk also about the last tree that is in this Garden of Eden, which is the palm tree. It's a special palm tree, the date tree that doesn't, uh, now it doesn't, at this time we cannot um, find it in Portugal, but it was, it is still in, um, uh, in Spain uh, since Al Andalus, which is this palmary of Elche, okay? So in fact, where is this paradise? I, paradise. Can, could only be in Iberia, as there was no better place to study plant, plants and produce artificial nature. I could end right here, but let me just say that all this expertise will be embodied in something that is almost unknown uh, in uh, um, a book, uh, um, a botanical garden. So all the we imagine that they would be studying like this, and so. We are going to say that there was a botanical garden in uh, Lisbon much sooner than that of Ajuda. And that one is the Orto Real de Chabregas in 1610, founded by the German physician Grizzly. And so this, the total novelty is that an, ar an herbarium next to the garden with dry plants to foster their study and use, and use by pharmacists. So this is uh, um, an amazing that we all, always thought that although we see all these spectacular gardens that there was no study behind it, it, could, it isn't possible. So the study and the expertise was built. Um, and here it is this marvelous book. There is another one. Well, another one by, these are the sources that he quotes. Um, he says here that this is also important, that it is the reason and experience and the sources that are all important. Uh, for these two books that he has made. And then uh, uh, he's going, so here we see that the, he's going far beyond this Dioscorides, which was the reference by then. And uh, I will hand here with this by José Correio de Serra that says here, he says that um, there was no one. So we, we, we never thought, we thought that Domingos Vandelli would be the first one or then Felix Brutero to write about the Portuguese flora. But well, no, uh, he says that Grizzly uh, with great work and diligence, uh, he has, and, and in fact, he has been the one uh, until now who has written about the Portuguese flora. So he recognized that he was a great expert, but insofar almost uh, unknown. Thank you so much for this. I think this is, oh, oh that was all. Then he hands that the old Portugal is a garden. And in the end, our goal is not only to build a memozine of gardens and landscape, but a memozine of art and science. And so we will be inspired by this by Abby Warburg, and thank you so much for your attention. And it is done. <laughs> Quite stressful in the end. <laughs> okay, so. So if you, uh, Patrice, if you could you just take the share. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. So, uh, I mean, we, we are a little bit short on time, but still with time for questions. So <laughs> please do.
do raise your questions. Yeah, yeah yes, Shima, please. please. I always have a question, especially when we're talking about such beautiful things like Anna <laughs> is. Uh, thank you for this very interesting talk, Anna, as always. My question is a small one. Uh, you mentioned the fabrication of kind of jeweled little statuettes and showed yes. of the orange tree. I'm curious whether this was kind of um, a sort of tree art that was mostly just for the orange tree or whether other trees were also celebrated in this way. Was it like any exotic tree people knew about? Was it something special about the orange? No, I, I think there are other natural, uh, uh, natural flowers, natural um, and uh, beings that it's not only orange. There yeah, are others. just among the trees out of curiosity. I wonder you would know, they make a common tree in such uh, beautiful material? Uh, there are some others, there okay. are some others. Remember, I don't know which tree now, but there are some others. It's not unique, although that one is perfect because it's just inspired like the Versailles one. <laughs> it's beautiful. Yeah, thank you so much. Beautiful talk. <laughs>